Hey guys, Stefan Fischer here from All of Road. In today's video, I would like to give you a walkthrough of my 2016 Jeep JK CRD four door. If you follow my channel, you know that I sold Tiny around eight months ago and um, not too long ago bought a Jeep JK. Let me quickly explain why I made the switch from Tiny to the Jeep. Tiny was great for three years. I really loved the portal axles. I loved how the vehicle drove. However, it also had a few shortcomings uh, for me. First of all, that Maxi Drive portal axles were never really designed for 37 inch tires. That pretty much meant I had to crawl every obstacle because as soon as I uh, gave it a little bit momentum, I had a big chance of breaking a stub axle. And as a matter of fact, I think I've broken seven of them over the past three years. The second thing is space. In Tiny, I really did not have space to do any longer trips where I would stay overnight. I also had driven pretty much every track I wanted to drive in Tiny, so it was time for something new to give me a new challenge and um, a new vehicle to get used to. So why did I purchase a Jeep JK? That is a good question. First of all, there are not that many new or reasonably new vehicles available I could purchase. As we have quite a few Jeeps in our group, I really like the Jeeps. I like that they are solid axle front and rear. I like the way the suspension is set up. But probably one of the biggest factors were that there are so many options for a Jeep. Nearly everything can be bought off the shelf. And while that did not prove to be 100% true, um, for example, there are no crawler gears available for the stock transfer case. So the only option is to really put an Atlas transfer case in or to find one of the super rare Rubicon automatic transfer cases, which I managed to find. If you follow my channel, you will know that I'm not a brand fanboy. I drive whatever um, suits me and it fits my purpose. I reckon as a play truck, it's actually a pretty good choice. So when I purchased the vehicle, it had already quite a few things done from a supposedly excellent Jeep outfitter in Queensland. However, after I got the vehicle over in New South Wales, actually on the way back, I had uh, the dreaded dead wobble, which I've never experienced before, and it really scared the daylight out of me. So when I got the vehicle here to Sydney, I made quite a few changes. So let's have a look at the protection and bar work I have on the Jeep. The bar work was there from the previous owner. It is a unique um, bull bar, which is ADR and airbag approved. Not the biggest fan of unique stuff, but the bar was on there. And so far it has served me quite well. I have longer wings, obviously, which I need for engineering. And I have them usually in the back of the vehicle and only put the short wings on when I'm going off-road because it gives me a better approach angle. I have a Kema rear bar. Again, not my first choice, but it was on the vehicle with a tire carrier to carry the big 37. And that's important. You can't really hang that off the door. If I buy a rear bar, I would purchase a different rear bar, uh, which has a little cutout for the 37s. And then you can get actually stronger door hinges so that you can have the tire on the door and it is a bit further tucked in. But as it is, that's all right for me. While the approach and departure angle of the Jeep is pretty good, the ramp over angle is quite average. So the sills do need good protection. The Poison Spider Brawler Rockers, which the previous owner installed, uh, do their job pretty well. And I think they look quite good and really do protect the sills. So I'm quite happy with that. I installed some Nemesis rear corner guards, which are out of aluminium to protect the rear corners a bit more. I also have an aftermarket fuel filler. 
At the moment I have the Poison Spider aluminium flares on the vehicle. They were there from the previous owner. While they are lightweight and I like the look, they are unfortunately a bit too narrow in the rear because of the Dana 60 there. And also if you really lean against them, they will bend the panels. So I'm still looking for a better solution there and especially something which fits my rear track width. But that seems to be very difficult uh, to get hold of. So that probably will need to be custom flares. Mud flaps, obviously necessary for road compliance but they really get in the way off-road. So I have some quick disconnects for the mud flaps, which makes it quite easy. So the previous owner installed the front runner table, which is quite handy. I installed a little swan light here. If I cook and so on here, that yeah, works pretty well. Haven't used it yet, but obviously self-explanatory. Yeah, I haven't done anything else with the rear yet. I really would like to have a very lightweight mesh storage system, but that is still something which needs to be tackled. Haven't done that yet. In the rear, I have the BCDC 1250D from Red Arc, which has a lithium profile as well as a solar input and it charges my 100 amp hour DCS Life PO4 battery with 50 amps. That means I really make use of the high charge current Life PO4 batteries allow. If you follow my YouTube channel, you know that I have done a lot of research into Life PO4 batteries. And at this stage, the DCS batteries are probably the best Life PO4 batteries on the market at the moment. DCS seems to be one to two years ahead of the competition. And if you like more details, please check out my Life PO4 videos. I also purchased these Australian made rear storage boxes, which are an easy bolt in solution. And they hold on one side my two compressors, on the other side the DCS battery. Then I have the Road Power RSP8000, which is a switch panel to the front of the vehicle, and all the fuses and wires go in the rear here. I also have a Victron BMV712 smart battery monitor with Bluetooth functionality, which tells me all the stats for my Life PO4 battery. The Bluetooth functionality on the Victron means I do not have to go to the rear of the vehicle to see all my stats, but conveniently can do that from the driver's seat. To be honest, in regards to electrical stuff, it's going to be either Red Arc or Victron uh, to be in my vehicle. I also installed a front and rear camera, which is here, and a few LED strips, which give me additional light. I also have replacement uh, rear lights, LED rear lights, which are DOT approved. Let me show you the air compressor setup and the corresponding air tank. To air up my big 37 inch tires and to run my lockers, I purchased two AOB CM400 12 volt uh, air compressors, which have a 100% duty cycle and 200 PSI. They are connected to a 6 liter 200 PSI air tank. I was hoping that setup would be faster than a dual ARB compressor, but it does seem to be actually slightly slower. Let's look a bit more into the Ultravision 180 Max. Uh, if you followed my videos, you know that I really like the Ultravision stuff. I have the Nitro Max uh, light bars on my cruiser and they have served me very well. Australian company, five years warranty. I haven't had ample chance to use the vehicle at night, but I've done a few little night drives and so far exactly what I expected uh, from the light. That's high beam ultra vision on. That's ultra vision the low beam. I really like the low beam option. That is regular. Seeing that now, I will adjust the tilt angle uh, two or three degrees higher. Definitely quite a difference. Ultravision is one of the few manufacturers who offers a 4000 and a 5700K color temperature option. For the driving lights, I prefer the 5700K option. However, for the light bars and close-up work, I pretty much prefer the warmer 4000K option. 
Even better, next to the five years warranty and the outstanding customer service, the lights are manufactured in Australia and if I can support Australian manufacturing, I'm always happy to do so. One more thing I really like on the UltraVision lights is that they have a high and a low beam option. I'm running a Warn VR12S winch. Warn has served me very well over the years. I have a Warn in the Land Cruiser and yeah, so far it never let me down. The winch only came with wired controls. However, I really wanted a remote control for the Warn. So Ben from Adrenaline Off-Road uh, ordered me one of the older style Warn remotes and then customized it a little bit so that it would fit with this winch. I've used the winch already in anger and yeah, it's all working well and I really like the small remote. One of the first things I did is replace my standard Jeep candles or the normal headlights, which hardly had any output, with a set of hog lights. The Hawk Lights uh, is an Australian company. They mainly do motorcycle lights, but they also have a good selection for the Jeep. So far, I really like the lights. I like the design of them. I like the look. It has a pretty good beam pattern and even better, seven years warranty. So value for money, they are excellent lights and I can't really fault them. The previous owner installed these JPR steel high flow heat reduction bonnet. While I don't mind the look, it's not something I would put on by myself, especially given that the Jeep only has a fairly small windscreen and the bulge of the bonnet reduces the visibility further. While I didn't measure before and after, I can see that it would keep the engine bay quite a bit cooler and provide much better ventilation. I also installed rock lights, which consist of one 10 watt LED spotlight in each wheel arch and a 20 watt LED spotlight on the rear cross member under the vehicle. This makes it much easier to spot in the night because you can see what is under the vehicle and if you ever have a breakdown in the evening that also provides light for repairs. So let's have a look under the bonnet. I have the 2.8 liter CRD uh, diesel engine and one of the first modifications was to install a pro vent. Oil catch cans are a simple device that can greatly benefit direct injected engines. They prevent oil and contaminants from causing buildup inside your engine's intake manifold. It's a bit hard to see, but behind the grill I have an auxiliary transmission cooler to keep the transmission temps lower. I just installed a battery, a wireless battery monitor, which iDrive provided me a few months ago for testing but I didn't have a chance yet so I thought I'm gonna install that now on my main starter battery because my auxiliary battery is obviously covered uh, with the Bluetooth application um, from DCS from Deep Cycle Systems and yeah just install that thing super easy two cables plus minus gonna cut that off fix it here and um, yeah, the app is Bluetooth and I show you that as well. So pretty neat. We'll see how that goes now, testing it for a little while. I'm really a big fan of the GME radios and for the Jeep, uh, GME kindly provided me one of their XIS packages, which I also have in the Land Cruiser for over a year now. And I really can't uh, fault that UHF. It does exactly what I expected to do. I already discovered that GME has an excellent customer service. Um, watch my dedicated uh, GME XRS review for a bit more info about that. It is definitely the most user-friendly and easiest to program um, radio on the market in my book. The four-wheel drive pack comes with two different antennas. The AE4705B, which is a 6.6 .6 DBI gain antenna, and I use that on my touring trips. It comes as well with the AW474B, um, which is a 2.1 dBi gain antenna and I use that on the Jeep because I do more hilly country and that works better uh, on undulated and hilly terrain. I run the ATX Pro Chamber bead locked wheels. Um, they are aluminium and yeah, they've served me quite well. Uh, they have suffered already a little bit, but um, that's what you expect. One thing I really like here that all the bolts for the bead locks are recessed. So that means you don't scrape them off on rocks. And as you can see here, rock rash does certainly happen. 
Tire-wise, I run the BFG KM3s, which I already have on the Land Cruiser, my touring vehicle for the past um, bit more of a year, actually. And yeah, so far, I'm very happy with them. It's a very good all-round tire. Uh, it gets me to the destinations, and so far, it has not let me down in the bush. Just watch my videos, see what I put that uh, tires through, and then really you can make up your mind. But yeah, they pretty much in the bush always run between 8 and 12 PSI, so at very low pressures and yeah, no issue whatsoever. I have used the BFG KM3 on various terrain. If you follow my channel, you know I do not like uh, mud much. However, it's not always avoidable and I also had the KM3 in mud. While it's not the best dedicated mud tire around, you know, you can't compare it with the Simex or, for example, a Maxi Trepador. It still performed pretty well in mud. And as I mentioned before, as an all-round play tire, uh, which still can be used on the road and can be driven to places, it does a pretty good job. Once I wear these set out, I would have no hesitation putting another set of BFG KM3 on the Jeep. As a matter of fact, after purchasing BFG tires for the past six years, I last year accepted a BFG ambassadorship. That means I gonna only run their tires for the time being and therefore receive the tires for free. I have a three inch stainless steel straight through exhaust system. I'm not exactly sure of the brand, but it seems to provide pretty good power and has a pretty decent sound. It's also a bit more tucked away than the stock system, so less prone to get bent and damaged. Let's talk about my Ruby transfer case, which I now have in the Jeep. That was actually quite an ordeal. So when I purchased the vehicle and picked it up from 7slot, who built it, uh, it was purchased privately, but uh, we agreed to meet at 7slot. I had a chat to Todd and he said, yeah, you, you can get a um, Rubicon transfer case for the car. We can organize one for you, no problem. So shortly afterwards, and when I got the car home and so on, I ordered the transfer case through them, which took ages to arrive. And uh, when it then arrived at uh, Solve Off-Road, who had the car at the time, it turned out they sent me a transfer case for the manual gearbox, not the auto gearbox. So absolutely not fitting. I called seven slot, um, oh, they apologized, said all no problem. We're gonna get you uh, the correct transfer case now. And fortunately then on the box of the transfer case uh, was actually the number of uh, the wrecker in Queensland where they source the transfer case from. So after a week or so and realizing how difficult it would be to get actually an automatic transfer case um, for the Rubicon, I called then the wrecker directly <laughs> and they then told me that, yeah, uh, they're sending me now a standard transfer case. And I said, what do you mean? Why a transfer standard case? I said, yeah, that's, that's what uh, Seven Slot ordered. And I said, why did you send me the, the manual transfer case in the first place if I have an auto gearbox? And he said, yeah, that, that's what they ordered. So the first transfer case was wrong. The second transfer case, which they were just about to send out, would have been a stock transfer case. So absolutely no use to me. So I canceled the whole order and it then took many, many weeks to actually get my money back because I paid three and a half grand uh, for that transfer case. And I heard, yeah, the money is coming, the money is coming, the money didn't come. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I eventually filed a charge back from my credit card and um, yeah, then received the money back. So it wasn't the most pleasant experience. I spoke then to a few other Jeep guys and asked whether someone could order me a transfer case and put it in, but that never did happen. And that's when my mate Phil came into the picture. Thanks a lot, Phil. He's a Jeep fanatic uh, and a very good mechanic. We chatted about it and I just was out of my depth because I didn't know which transfer case fitted. I didn't want to order a transfer case from the US, which then wouldn't fit. 
Um, Phil did a lot of the research. He found me a transfer case overseas, um, which satisfied both of us that that would be the right transfer case. So I ordered that. And then Phil came down here and I helped him to put the transfer case in the car, which was really a three and a half, four hours job. It actually would have been at least one and a half hours quicker if we wouldn't have found another unexpected surprise from the previous build. So what they've done to make the yoke fit because it didn't have the recess in it is they've chucked a piece of nylon in there which is no good at all. As you can see that the, um, the, the nylon is going to compress when you do the yoke up so when we pulled the yoke off it was, it was loose. So it's um, been a bit of uh, a fail in the scheme of things. Yeah. So hopefully the steel mach machined up space and it'll be right. Because as you can see here, this is the original one. And this is the one which was on there now. And this recess is missing. And that means, yeah. So this was just butting up on the end of the spline inside of there. Yeah. And there's another ledge in there that the bearing sits on and just jamming up there then then that had to float backwards and forwards yeah. to take up the five mil gap. So now we're machining a spacer eight mil which then gives us the right distance. Huh? The right distance so yeah. it won't bind up. I guess that is the risk you take when you purchase a vehicle which has been built by someone else. In this case, I assumed it would have been better built, to be honest, and I relied on their word uh, when I asked for pre-purchase inspection. But um, yeah, it is what it is. I have fixed now all the issues from the original build and I'm very happy with the car and it certainly is now built up to my standards and what I like in a vehicle. So having the Ruby transfer case definitely um, transformed the vehicle because the gearbox is very jumpy, low down on, on big rock steps. Uh, with the gearing I had, I just didn't have enough grunt there to gently climb up. I had to put the foot down, then all of a sudden the car accelerated. So yeah, very happy so far, works very well. Not easy to source. But uh, if you can get one, I definitely recommend to get one in your car. The other option would have been an Atlas transfer case, but an Atlas transfer case would have been uh, 10 grand at least. And I really didn't want to spend that much money on it. The Ruby transfer case improved drivability off-road uh, greatly. However, I noticed that it became far more difficult to get from low range back into high range. So I purchased an advanced adapters um, heavy duty transfer cable upgrade, which hopefully makes it a bit easier and less likely to break something. Okay, let me show you my front axle setup. This is my front setup when I initially purchased the vehicle. I purchased it privately from a guy in Queensland. However, um, he told me that the whole car was built by 7Slot. So I contacted 7Slot. I wanted them to do a pre-purchase inspection, offer to pay for it. They said, no, the vehicle is uh, in top condition. It had been built and serviced by them and was, yeah, ready to go, nothing to be done. So given that this was my first Jeep, I trusted them. I flew down, picked the vehicle up. But within the first 150 kilometers uh, driving the vehicle back to New South Wales, I had the dreaded dead wobble. And that really was uh, scary. If you haven't experienced that, your steering uh, starts shaking and the car gets really out of control and you right away have to stop the car. I ratchet strapped the suspension down and managed to drive home. It was quite disappointing to discover these and a few other things um, from a vehicle which supposedly was built by a Jeep specialist and was ready to go without anything needed to be done. After a bit more research, I decided to replace the whole front end and I went with the G2 Core 44 American-made housing. This is an improved and much stronger Dana 44 and really with my tire size, the driving I do, that should be sufficient. In the process, I also decided to change my gearing from 4.1 to 4.56. The two available locker options for the G2 is the Harrop Eden E-Locker and the ARB Air Locker. And if you follow my channel, you know that I definitely went with the ARB Air Locker. I also run 35 spline axles in the front. 
in regards to a suspension i'm running 2.5 inch remote reservoir king shocks the springs i'm not entirely sure they were already in the vehicle that uh, equates to a little bit shy of a four inch lift and the teraflex speed bump stops unfortunately not everything went smooth here Due to the bad front setup from the previous owner, both front shocks had to be rebuilt as they touched the frame and were both bent. The Terraflex speed bump bump stops are progressive bump stops, which connect much earlier and progressively compress over a longer distance so provide a much smoother ride. At the moment I'm running front sway bar quick disconnects, but I have an anti-rock sway bar lying here, just need to install it, as the bushes on the quick disconnects wear out a bit too quick. When I purchased the vehicle, I found out that the steering box was pretty worn. So after replacing the steering box, I also put in a Synergy sector shaft brace kit, which should provide a bit more stability for a reasonably weak steering box if you run 37 inch tires. The front drive shaft is a 1310 Tom Woods drive shaft and the control arms are ARB adjustable control arms. Let's now have a look at the rear setup of my vehicle. In the rear I have a Curry RockJock Dana 60 which has semi-floating 40 spline axles. It has a high clearance center section with a rotated cover to improve diff clearance. It has a high pinion design which raises the drive shaft by 2 inches for additional clearance. For the rear suspension I don't know exact ratings of the springs but I have the 2.5 inch remote reservoir King shocks and the Terraflex bump stops. I have OME adjustable rear lower control arms and the Curry anti-rock off-road sway bars which don't need uh, disconnecting. The rear drive shaft is a custom 1350 Gibbs heavy duty drive shaft. The rear panard drop bracket which was part of the original build must have been welded at a very late night because the welding was atrocious. So I had solved off-road to cut that bracket off and weld on a proper bracket. So like all of my vehicles, the Jeep JK is also engineered for all major modifications. Does engineering mean that you can't get pulled over by a cop and you can't be defected? No, it certainly does not. However, if you have done your due diligence, if you have your vehicle engineered, if you have passed the lane change test, the brake test, um, it will be much, much easier to clear any defect, obviously provided that you didn't make any modification afterwards. So in my book, engineering is vital because otherwise you drive a vehicle which is not road legal and you may actually void your insurance. I always get asked many questions about the engineering process and so on. And unfortunately, I can't really answer everyone there. However, if you're one of my Patreon supporters, I'm more than happy to answer quick questions and give you some guidelines in regards to engineering. Okay, let me show you through the inside of the vehicle and what changes I made there. The passenger and driver side has some wild boar grab handles which make uh, getting into the car on an angle a bit easier. I have the Daystar lower switch panel for my lockers and my ultra vision driving light. However, I'm not too happy with that panel to be honest. It constantly pops out on the top. So yeah, I'm not too impressed with it. The iDrive sits on the left hand side of my steering column and it's a great little tool, especially for the auto. I really like it and can recommend it. I use U1 for on-road and for big rock steps where I need a fast take up. And I use E9 for all the general rock crawling for pretty doughy throttle. I also purchased a reverse camera system from Safety Dave because I didn't want to have a second monitor or change my head unit. I opted for a reverse mirror screen. That works quite well and now allows me to see when I reverse where I'm actually driving. I also put a cargo net over the rear seats which holds uh, some light uh, clothing items. On the right hand side of the steering column I have the Road Power RSP8000 switch panel which houses a main on and off switch for my camera, for my air compressor, my auxiliary battery and my rock lights. On each rear seat I have one of the MSR seat organizers for all my little stuff, my cables and so on. I also installed a second double cigarette lighter output which is wired into my uh, switch panel and to the rear battery. 
which means I can charge my batteries, cameras and the like while the ignition is off. So guys, thanks a lot for watching. I hope you enjoyed the walkthrough of my Jeep JK. Um, it's pretty much where I wanted, maybe a few small things, but overall I'm pretty happy with it. After driving it now for eight uh, months, what are the drawbacks? What don't I like on the Jeep? First of all, it was a pretty big change from a portal axle defender to the Jeep, because one thing the Jeep doesn't have is a good ramp over angle. The fuel tank hangs pretty low, the cross members uh, come a bit down. So in regards to ground clearance, the Jeep is certainly not uh, the best vehicle. So that is something where I wish I could get more ground clearance and maybe I do a few mods. There is an option of cutting the fuel tanks in half and moving two fuel tanks left and right. Um, therefore, do, they don't hang down that far and then get a custom cross member manufactured which doesn't come down but is flat. So that should give me more ground clearance. But we will see whether I go to that extent. But so far, that really is the only thing. The gearbox could be a bit less snappy, but now with the iDrive um, together with the Rubicon transfer case, that works pretty well. So I'm pretty happy with the vehicle. I just need a bit better ramp over angle. But now I can actually squeeze it a little bit when I need to. I don't need to be constantly afraid of breaking an axle. And all the suspension bounce I had in Tiny is gone. Not to mention that I now have a pretty comfortable vehicle to drive. I have enough room for my camera gear, for passenger and camping gear. So it really fulfilled all the reasons why I changed. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and maybe got some useful information out of it. Please keep in mind, this is a privately funded uh, channel. I don't do any paid reviews. I don't have any big sponsors. So all of this comes out of my own pocket. So if you can, it would be greatly appreciated if you could head over to Patreon and become one of my Patreon supporters. With a small monthly payment, you really can help me to stay independent and make these videos for you. I also receive many, many questions every day from all sorts of subjects, from travel advice, from car build advice, from location advice. It is impossible for me to answer all these questions. However, as a Patreon supporter, you have direct access to me via the Patreon platform. Any easy questions asked there, I will do my best to answer that question. You will also receive all my videos a few days earlier and some exclusive videos only released on Patreon. So if you can afford it, maybe head over there and shout me a cup or two of coffee per month. Thanks a lot for watching. See you along the tracks.